I'm with Kurt Tussaw, lawyer in the R.V. Smith marijuana extract case that was in the Supreme Court of Canada today. Kirk, how you doing? I'm feeling great, Jeremy. Uh, tired, relieved, uh, exhausted, ecstatic. It's really uh, a, a gamut of emotions. Wow, so it sounds like there's some positive emotions in there. How did the Supreme Court case go today? Well, I, I thought our submissions went in very well. We were in the uh, enviable position of being the respondents, which means we uh, won below twice. So it was up to the Crown to really convince uh, the Supreme Court that uh, the judges below and the BC Court of Appeal and the trial court judge uh, Johnston erred in uh, their application of the law. Uh, and I think we built a very, very good record at trial. Uh, I tried to keep reminding the justices of the human elements to this story. Uh, you know, it's, it's important to talk about concepts like liberty, like security of the person, like uh, the principles of fundamental justice. But it's also important, I think, to center it in the real life human struggles that people are going through every day. Uh, and those are the struggles of our patient witnesses. Uh, and so I thought that that, that resonated well. Um, so, <laughs> you know, that's how I feel today. Um, ask me again when we get a decision in a few months. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, Kirk, now just to bring people up to speed on exactly what this case means for those who aren't familiar, can you just quickly run through, I mean, why this case is so important and what the, what the stakes are here? Well, I think it's important primarily for three reasons. The first is it's the first time that the Supreme Court of Canada has ever considered the issue of medical cannabis uh, and its relationship with Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, as well as Section 7 of the Charter, which protects uh, Canadians life, liberty, and security of the person from being deprived, except in accordance with the principles of justice. So, it's an historic case, it's a case of first impression. Uh, the second reason uh, that I think it's of critical importance uh, is that it represents uh, an attempt uh, to expand the understanding of courts and Canadians uh, that medicine that you find in, in cannabis uh, isn't part of the dry plant matter. It's actually in the trichomes that uh, grow primarily, but not exclusively, on the uh, on the flowering heads of female plants. That's the medicine, uh, and restricting patients to uh, only the dried marijuana and not letting them do things like uh, produce oils or cookies and things like that in the privacy of their own homes, uh, we say is a severe intrusion to their fundamental decision making. And the, I guess the third is this: uh, as a remedy, uh, we suggest that the Supreme Court. So, Kirk, the, on the legal side of things, how was this that, I mean, how is it that it actually fits into the legal aspect here? What were you arguing on the legal side? Well, we argued that uh, patient's uh, choice was restricted uh, on issues of fundamental personal importance in medical decision making. We said that that was a violation of the liberty and security of the person rights protected by Section 7 of the Charter. That's what the courts below found. Uh, and the government's entitled to restrict those rights, but only if it does so in accordance with principles of fundamental justice. And those are essentially three, arbitrariness, uh, which means that the law's effects have uh, no connection to or run contrary to the law's objectives. Uh, Overbreath, which means while there may be some minimal connection between the law's objectives and its actual impact, uh, it captures into its ambit conduct that does not implicate those objectives. And finally, gross disproportionality. And that's where the court looks at the objectives, the importance of the objective, and then looks at the consequences of, of achieving that objective and decides and asks, 
it, are those two grossly disproportionate to each other? Are the effects grossly disproportionate to the legislative objective? Uh, and we say that the ban on uh, non drag forms of cannabis violates all three of those principles of fundamental justice. And so in order to get here to the Supreme Court, this is, I mean, this isn't the first try, essentially, in the courts at this. This has been pushed to this with, through an appeal. Um, what was the, I mean, how, what was the win before and then there was an appeal? Is that how it went? Well, we won at the trial court level. Uh, the trial court judge agreed with the proposition that I've just put to you about the violation of Section 7. Mm -hmm. The uh, Crown appealed. We went to the B.C. Court of Appeal. We won again in 2014 uh, on a two-to-one uh, minority decision, uh, again, agreeing with the prospect that charters violated by the ban on everything that drives forms of cannabis. Uh, but because there was a dissent, the uh, appeal was of right, and so Canada had to make the case, the Crown appealed the case, uh, and that's what ended up uh, here today in Ottawa. Right, and now this is basically the last stop. Uh, there's no higher court than the Supreme Court case. And once, and uh, the decision itself, you said, could take a few months. I think they're running about four months average on decisions right now. Of course, it's up to the court, uh, and uh, we have no control over that time. Now, could the the judge will come back and make some decision? Would he then instruct the government to, you know, make this as part of the new MMPR system, or is there what are the options that he would really give them? Do you think? Well, it's not not a he. It's a panel of justice. Right. Now, there's nine. They, there's nine. Nine, uh, yes. Justice Beverly McLaughlin and the other justices. Um, there are only seven sitting today, so only seven will take part in the decision, uh, which means we need to uh, have at least four agree with our position. As I said earlier, um, the remedy that we seek is an exemption to the Control of Drugs and Substances Act to take medical cannabis completely out of that regulatory scheme. As a practical matter, what would occur by operation of law at that juncture is the cannabis intended for commercial production uh, and sale and marketing would become regulated under the natural health product regulation because the natural health product regulation regulates all plants uh, that are commercially sold for which medical claims are made. Uh, it would just happen by operation of law. Um, however, cannabis uh, that one grows for oneself or possesses for oneself or turns into extracts for oneself you can do all those things with natural health products. You don't need permission from the government to do so. Uh, and I said to the Supreme Court of Canada today, that's the appropriate way to deal with these things. There's no reason why individual Canadian citizens need permission from the state to uh, have cannabis for medical purposes. It's a severe uh, infringement on their liberty and security personal right. The state interposing themselves between people and, and medicine is effective for them. And it doesn't achieve any uh, legitimate state objectives. Uh, to criminalize patients in that way, and, and hopefully the court agrees with me. Absolutely, Kirk. Well, it's a really exciting case, and uh, I mean, we're all kind of on edge to see how this will affect <laughs> the medical marijuana program. I mean, there's a lot really <laughs> to say. Both. Yeah, no kidding. Well, Kirk, great work, and uh, I can't wait to uh, find you. out what's happening. We'll definitely be in touch with you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Kirk.